Hi, I'm Lucky Phil, and let's face it, it's still a Windows world out there. Around 90% of computers are still running Windows, and a lot of them aren't running too well. Unfortunately, many people still believe that the only way to reinstall their system is to reformat their hard drive, insert a Windows CD, and start from scratch, just to end up with a Windows XP install that already comes pre-bundled with a bunch of shit they don't need, then they need to reinstall device drivers, antivirus, anti-spyware, service packs, hotfixes, the rest of the Windows updates. Many, many people just reckon it's more trouble than it's worth, and therefore don't bother. In this segment, I'm going to show you a couple of tools I use that make that whole process a lot easier. The first thing I'll show you is Enlight, which you can download from EnlightOS.com. This allows you to customize your install the way you want. You can remove things from the install like Outlook Express, MSN Messenger, MSN Explorer, Movie Maker, additional language files, and you can include things you do want. Things like service packs, drivers, hotfixes, etc. You can even bundle programs. So in the past you may have done a Windows reinstall and then gone out to download things like uh, antivirus, uh, firewall, anti-spyware, Firefox, WinRAR. You can now bundle these with Windows, so instead of need needing to download them later on, they're installed for you right from the get-go. Two more things to grab are, of course, Service Pack 2, and you also want to grab the updates that have come out since Service Pack 2. In this case, I'm downloading Ryan VM's Post SP2 Update Pack. When you start up Enlight, it asks you where your install files are and where you would like to save the modified files. So just pick your source, pick where you would like to save the modified files, and then Enlight will copy those files over for you. Now the files have copied over, I can see some information about my inst install files. For example, the version number, what the file size is, and how much free space I have. I don't have any presets, so I'll skip through this page and I can now select which options I would like Enlight to perform. In this case, I'm going to do everything. You can now integrate Service Pack 2 into your Windows XP install. So I'll do that now. And I'll wait for the files to copy over. Okay, those files have been copied over. They are now integrated into your Windows XP install. So after you install Windows XP, you don't need to then install Service Pack 2 manually. Now you've done that, you can select the update packs and, and, and other programs you've downloaded and you wish to include with the install. Now you can include your drivers. Now many times when you download a driver, they come as a single executable. What you'll need to do is extract that executable using something such as WinRAR. Now drivers are installed into Windows using an INF file. Now fortunately, Enlight has made the, inst the process of including drivers very easy. You just select multiple driver folder, select where the drivers are located, and it then searches those folders for the INF files. These are the ones that I want. And it's simple as that. Now for the fun part, we can remove components from the Windows install. This screen pops up to say, what functionality do you require from Windows? Whatever options you select in here, it then removes the options from the list in here. Now I don't require any of this functionality, so I'm just going to leave that blank and hit OK. For most of my purposes, I find that uh, the preset of safe is fine for me. There's just a few little customizations I need to make. You can now set up your installs to perform pretty much unattended. Basically, in these screens, the more information you put in, the less it'll bother you during the install. So let's go through and set this up. We can now customize even further. There isn't anything I really need to specify in here, so I'll just hit next. And now we can apply some tweaks to the Windows install.
Now we have even more tweaks. I'll leave these the way they are. And now this is finished, we just hit yes and let Enlight do its magic. And now we're done. If, if you'd like to add any additional files or folders to your install CD, you can do so just by dragging and dropping them here. And once you're done, you can make that an ISO file, which you can then burn off to CD. The next program I'll show you is BART's pre-installed environment, or BART PE. This tool allows you to make a bootable Windows XP Live CD, which you can boot off to safely get rid of your, your current Windows install. You can delete your Windows folder, delete your program files folder, and once you back up the stuff within it, you can delete the documents and settings folder. It basically allows you to completely get rid of your, your current Windows XP install, so you can reinstall cleanly. To use it, you simply run the PE Builder, tell it where your installation files are for Windows, and then you tell it where you would like it to place the ISO file, which you will later burn off. Okay, now that I've burnt off BART PE and Enlight, I'm good to go. At the moment, I'm recording this video on the computer about to be reinstalled, so I'll capture what, what I do using video out, and I'll see you on the other side.
and I'm back. My system is reinstalled. It's up to date and it's ready for me to use. The only thing I have left to do now is to reinstall a few programs I'd use regularly. As you can see, the process was relatively painless and it took around 45 minutes to an hour from the time I shut down my previous install to the time this one became usable. The best part of all is I didn't need to move all my, all my data off. I just moved it aside, got rid of Windows and I reinstalled cleanly. For, for more information and for links to everything I've mentioned, please visit our website with the show notes. That's at www.bsodtv.org. Okay, hopefully in this segment I can shed some light on electronics. A lot of websites have schematics and plans on how to build your own stuff, and plus, most people who are into computer mods that put up websites and instructions automatically assume you know the most basic of electronic skills. However, if you don't, I'll shed some light with this segment. The first thing I want to cover is Ohm's Law. Ohm's Law is a, basics of, a basis of how to calculate power, current, voltage, and resistance, among some other things. I'm not going to get too complicated right now. You can easily go to Google and type in Ohm's Law Calculator and it'll do all the, all the math for you. However, you won't have an understanding of what exactly it is. Now, Ohm's Law is really easy to remember just by remembering this phrase. Ohm's Law's very important rule is it's easy as pi. Now, very important rule, V-I-R, each first letter of the words, V-I-R, voltage, is current times resistance. And current is voltage divided by resistance, and resistance is voltage divided by current. Now, easy as pi, P-I-E. Power is current times voltage. Now, current is power divided by voltage. And voltage is power divided by current. Easy as pi. Now, um, another thing it deals with is the resistor color code. The resistor color code is really easy to remember. If you can just remember this, the color code it has individual colors. I'll explain a little bit more later on this. It has individual colors. Each color represents a numerical value. Now, to remember the numerical values, remember this. Bad boys rape our young girls, but Violet goes willingly. I know you're probably laughing right now, but each one of those words, just like, you know, very important rule, easy as pie, it, it represents numerical value for each word and, and color. So, bad boys rape our young girls, but Violet goes willingly, translates to black, brown, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, gray, white. That's zero through nine. So, with just those, those little quick tips, you can understand it. Now, behind me I have my electronics work desk, so we're going to turn around, and I'm going to give you a brief intro to parts, components, schematic symbols, everything you need to do to read a map, use an iron, and build your first schematic. So, let's get to it. I have some components in front of me, most commonly used in a lot of electronics nowadays. Um, this board that everything's attached into is called a breadboard. Now, a breadboard is really great for prototyping, so you don't have to get down and solder and, and get all messy with that mumbo-jumbo. The breadboard has rows and columns. Now, all of these long strips right here are actually one. They're all connected. However, they're not connected this way. So what you can do is you can place your parts inside of these little slots and arrange them so you can jump wires and, and components around without actually having to be building a circuit board. Breadboards can come in whole bunches of sizes and shapes and forms. They can get a little expensive from time to time, but they're great if you plan on doing a lot of prototyping. I've hooked up some com common components into the breadboard, and I'm going to show you their functions. Um, the first runner-up is a diode. A diode is a one-way gate for electricity. It'll allow it to flow one way, but not the other. Now, I can't exactly show you how a diode works because, I mean, it, that's, you just got to take my word for it. It's just a one-way gate. Um, diodes are most commonly used as um, a crude form of signal flow protection, you know, mostly for, like, serial ports and whatnot, just in case um, you plug it in backwards or incorrectly, voltage can't flow the wrong way. It could also be used in turning an analog voltage signal into a digital voltage signal. Now, a diode has an anode and a cathode. The cathode is signified by a black stripe on the diode, which is, which is considered the negative. Cathode is always negative, anode is always positive. So this side is the cathode, this side is the anode. Our next runner-up is an, a light-emitting diode. I'm pretty sure everyone's seen these things. They're in all forms of electronics nowadays. When you pass voltage across them, they just light up. 
And just like the name implies light emitting diode, you can only plug them in one way. If you plug them in backwards, they won't, they won't work. Now, LEDs don't like uh, having too much uh, voltage and current run across them, so you know you have an unhappy LED if, um, if it just starts to slowly dim or even explode. Now, um, the LED will actually have a beveled edge to signify the cathode and it'll have a rounded edge to signify the anode. So even, even though you, uh, you have no idea like which one's which, now, now you do, because LEDs will always have one beveled edge. This little guy right here is called a resistor. A resistor is measured in ohms. Now, a resistor uh, slows the flow of electrons, meaning it turns higher voltage into lower voltage. Now, you'd have to calculate exactly using Ohm's law what resistor you would need to create, you know, one from one voltage level to another. Now, the LED is hooked up in series with an LED. Now, this is the before a resistor, and this is after a resistor. Now, to determine a, re a resistor's color, uh, a resistor's ohm value, there's a color code on top of it with four bands. Now, three bands, the first three bands, are going to be from uh, black to white, you know, like I, like I described earlier. And the last band is going to be either gold or silver. Gold meaning it's got a 5% tolerance or a 10% tolerance. The tolerance being how far off from the exact value. Um, I'll go into uh, resistor color codes a little bit later. This little blue guy right here is called a capacitor. Now, a capacitor temporarily uh, holds a small amount of, of electricity. Its, um, its storage value is called a farad. A lot of capacitors are either in the pico farad or the nano farad. Um, this little guy is actually hooked up in parallel with an LED. Now, capacitors hold electricity for a short amount of time, so when I remove power, instead of it just abruptly stopping, it slowly dims. Capacitors are, are often used in timing circuits, um, voltage regulator circuits, filters, um, audio circuits, and I think that's about it. I mean, I think that's the most common. Right over here, uh, this little LED right here, I actually have, it's a, it's a multicolor changing LED. So when you apply power to it, it goes through all its wonderful little colors. Until it pops, because I'm passing a lot of voltage across it. Okay, I also have some basic switches. We all know a basic push-button switch. You know, you push the button, it turns on. But it's not always that simple. There's two types of push-button switch. Normally open and normally close. Normally open means you have to push the switch to close the circuit, meaning letting, letting electricity flow through. Normally closed means when you push it, it breaks the circuit, turning it off. Here's also another kind of a push button switch, keyboard key. Then you have a simple toggle switch, turns on, turns off. Now, this has two posts, meaning it's a single post, single throw. It has two positions, on and off. This is single post, double throw. It has three pins, commonly used in selector switches. So you can select from one of two positions. This is a double, a single post double throw, meaning it's two single post switches combined into one. So you hook these two up to, to a device, and then you hook these two. So when you flip the switch, each one of these is individually passing voltage across it. This is just some of the very basic of basic stuff, uh, electronic components. And there are a lot more such as transistors and inductors, but we'll, we'll save that for another day. I'm going to give everyone a quick crash course in soldering. Soldering is one of the best ways of putting together a circuit board. If you know of a better way, please tell me. Here's my soldering iron. Standard 30 watt Radio Shack soldering iron. Put on a new tip though. Yes, your, rate, your iron will start to turn this disgusting brown color. Now I'm going to plug my iron in and as it warms up I'll explain to you soldering. Now. The wattage of an iron will, will denote um, how powerful it is. Now, the hotter the, the solder, the soldering iron, the more industrial you can get. Like a 15 watt soldering iron is really good for low end stuff. 30 watts in general purpose, 100 watt you're practically welding. 
Now, when it comes to um, wire itself, this is called 36 gauge wire. The gauge of a wire determines how thick it is. The lower, uh, the bigger the number, the thin, uh, the thinner the wire. These, these guys right here, these are uh, 22 gauge copper wire. Now, there are two main kinds of wire. You have stranded, which is much, much more flexible, and solid, which is easier to work with. Now, the thicker the wire, the easier it is to work with, especially when solid, and the more current it can actually, uh, it can, it can actually handle. Now, when it comes to solder itself, um, I just get whatever generic brand Radio Shack solder, and um, that's it. Now, there's something called flux. Flux is a type of a low acid that helps solder stick to other metals. If you're having a very hard time getting your solder to stick to things, try a little bit of flux. However, it's not necessary. The solder that I usually get from Radio Shack already has flux inside. It's called a, um, a rosin core solder. Our iron is, is hot, is finally hot enough, and the first thing you want to do when you get a first new tip is put a little bit of solder on it. This is called tinning the tip, making it nice and silver. Now, I've also got something called a uh, tip cleaner, which once your iron's hot, you dip in it and it gives it a nice shiny coat. Now, I like to just flick all the extra off. And uh, I'm going to zoom into this, this motherboard right now, and I'm going to show you how to solder a wire onto a very small, small point. Okay, we're zoomed into our motherboard, and the first thing you want to do is something called tinning your wire. And basically what that means is, trying to get the solder into the shot, put a little bit of solder, fucking solder. There, my solder. Put a little bit of solder, wrong end of the wire, on the wire. There we go. Now, we've got a nice silver tinned coat of solder on the wire. Now what you do is you put your wire up to the pad you want to solder, put your iron on it, melt the solder, and then there you go. It's soldered on. Now, look at the size of that point. Most people say it's so hard to modify, a, you know, circuits with very small contact points. I just did it in seconds. I mean, this goes this goes for everything. I mean, I have some 36 gauge Kynar wire. I'm going to tin the tip off camera, of course, because it's just so much easier for me. And I'm going to see if I can go and get, let's see, where's there a point on this board? Is this on, on screen? Yeah, that's on screen. Here we go. Here's a tiny little point. Now, of course, if you notice me shaking, I don't have the best nerves. I don't have a very steady hand. And of course, I think I need a beer right about now. There you go. I just soldered it on. That's a quick crash course in soldering. It's not very difficult. Primary thing is be very careful of the soldering iron. It's hot. I've actually seen people um, do phallic gestures with their soldering iron, drop it, and then grab the hot end. Well, let's just say that person wouldn't be um, coming home to his girlfriend, you know, Rosie Palm and her five friends, anytime soon. Um, the best thing about soldering is practice, 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 practice. Don't practice on something you enjoy. This is an old, crapped-out motherboard that I have no objection with soldering onto and off of. So, if you really do want to practice soldering, this is the way to go. If you have to solder two wires together, pre-tin both wires. If you have to solder components together, pre-tin both components. There you go, quick crash course. I hope you develop your soldering skills and let us know how well you're progressing with electronics. Have fun and good luck. Welcome to Hacking Motorola Cell Phones. First, some definitions. A flash file. A flash file is the basic software a phone needs to control its hardware. Basically, getting a new flash file would improve stuff like camera quality, menu speed, and reception. Also, a flex, which is a flex will allow you to access new features, as will Steam editing, 
gain new ringtones, get new wallpapers, remove company branding, etc. A monster pack is very simply just a flash and a flex in one file. And you only have to flash your phone once instead of twice. Another thing is carry unlocking, also called SIM unlocking, and some people just call it plain unlocking. Uh, basically, it removes carrier locks on a GSM phone so you can use a phone you bought from a provider on any other network. For example, if you bought a phone from Singular, when you take it out of the store, you can only use it on Singular's network. After you unlock it, you can use it on any GSM network. And finally, Seams. Seams basically control on your phone what features are activated and what features are deactivated. And I'll have a link to a good map of what seems do what in the show notes. Some of the phones that you'll be able to use for some of the mods in this segment are the Motorola V180, V188, V220, V3, also known as the Razer, the V3i, the V300, the V330, the V360, the V400, the V500, the V551, the V557, the V600, the V635, the A630, the Sliver L7, and the Rocker E1. And those last two are the uh, iTunes phones. And the phone does not have to be carry on lock to do most of these hacks. Now, in order to do stuff to your phone, you'll need software, obviously. Uh, First, you'll need Motorola PST, which stands for Product Support Tool. This is a piece of software used by Motorola technicians for basic repair and upgrading of Motorola phones. Uh, we're going to use this program simply to have drivers for any Motorola phone that you'll need to flash. It's kind of a pain, but it has to be done. And this program is not freely distributed, but if you do a Google search for it, you should be able to find the download link. The second piece of software we're going to be using today is called Motorola RSD Lite. This is another piece of software used by Motorola technicians for basic repair and upgrading of Motorola phones. It has an easier to use GUI interface over PST and we're going to be using this program in the tutorial to flash or flex your phone. Once again, it's not freely distributed, but if you do a Google search you should be able to find the download link. Another piece of software is called P2K Tools. This is a piece of software that's a, that has a nice GUI for extracting phone book entries, text messages, editing and removing ringtones, Java applications, graphics, videos, hiding and changing features, changing the outer LCD text on your phone, editing your game tables, and doing scene editing. Later in this segment, I'm going to show you a little tutorial on how to use this program to do some fun stuff. This program is freely distributed and it's very easily findable by doing another Google search. Another program that we're not going to be using today is called Motorola MPT or Mobile Phone Tools. Uh, this is a piece of software that comes with some premium phone packages and sometimes it'll come with your cable. This offers a bit easier way to add ringtones, graphics, and videos to your phone than P2K tools, but with MPT you can't delete locked videos, ringtones, or graphics. Also, if this program didn't come with your phone or cable, it costs an additional $50. Now, flash flex file. For flashing or flexing your phone, you obviously need a file to do it. And you can get them at one of two sites that I'm going to post in the show notes. And make sure the file you get doesn't lock your phone to a network, especially a network you're not on because some flashes will do that and then you'll, if your phone is already locked, you'll have to go to some place and get it unlocked, which is a pain. And I'll post some good files and stuff in the show notes. Also, make sure that you get a file for your model of phone because if you get a file for another model, it may break your phone. First, a couple of warnings. Doing this may void your warranty and possibly break your phone. So if you're worried about that, you may want to get accidental insurance through your provider. So if anything goes wrong, they'll replace your phone. 
Also, these mods should work for most Motorola GSM phones. If you try these mods on a CDMA or IDEN phone, you might brick your phone. And BSOD is not liable for any damage you do to your phone if you try these mods and brick your phone. It's not likely, but it happens. So try making a post on the BSOD forums or on some cell phone forums, like such as Howard Forums or Motomodders.net. And they're both really great communities, and they should be able to help you. Now, to mod your phone, you're going to need some hardware. You're going to need, obviously, a GSM Motorola phone. You're going to need, once again, pretty obvious, a computer. And you're going to need a data cable for your phone. You can, unfortunately, flash your ph phone over Bluetooth. That won't work. Now, depending on what kind of phone you have, it may use one of two cables. It may either use a little Motorola proprietary cable or a little mini USB cable. This mini USB cable, it comes with a lot of different devices and, you know, a lot of uh, digital cameras and cell phones and PDAs and all kinds of stuff. And if you don't have one lying around the house, you can probably pick one up for about five bucks. The Motorola cable is a little bit harder to find because it's proprietary. Uh, but you should be able to find it in a cell phone store for about 20 to 40 bucks or online for about 10 or 15. And to connect it to your phone, we'll do the proprietary first. All you do is you just connect it to the bottom and make sure it clips. Pretty easy, you know. Sometimes you have to wiggle it a little bit because it won't make a good connection, but it's pretty easy. And for the mini USB, you just very easily stick it into your phone, and you're done. Now, okay, there are two types of cables that you may see at Radio Shack or different places for really cheap that you might think you might be able to use if you need the proprietary cable. Either a cable for Nextel phones or a future dial cable. Those two will not work. The Nextel one won't fit and future dial cables, you can only use their proprietary software to move ringtones and uh, phone book entries and stuff like that. Okay, so now I am going to show you a tutorial on how to flash and flex your phone and uh, and how to do how to use P2K tools. Now I'm going to show you how to back up the pictures and the ringtones and the videos you have stored on your phone, how to flash the phone, and then how to do some mods, put those files you just backed up back on the phone, and some other little things. We're going to be using, for this right now, a Razer V3 that is already connected to the computer. I'm going to open up P2 Tool, which is what we're going to use for backing up, and as you can see, the phone is connected. There's a little green light down here saying that the phone is connected. And it's a V3. Now, you might be seeing all these tabs and wondering what they do. And I'm going to explain that after we flash the phone because when we flash it, it'll overwrite all those features anyway. And so there's no point in showing them to you now. Now, to connect the phone, all you do is you open up P2 Key Tools you connect the phone to the cable and then you push connect. Now, to back up all your files, you just refresh the Explorer to get your file list. And then all your all your multimedia files are in A, B, and all your ringtones are in audio. Your videos are in video, obviously, and your pictures are in picture. I don't have any pictures on here because I do not use this phone that much. Now, all you would do is you would go to a picture that you want to save, you would right click it, and then you would click download, and then it would simply 
ask you where to save it, and download it to a folder. And you would do that with all the pictures that you've taken, or all the ones you want, and the video and audio as well. Now, we're going to leave KTools and open up RSD Lite to flash the phone. As you can see, RSD Lite already shows the phone is connected and there would be my IMEI for the phone. The software that the technology it's on, which is it's a quad band GSM phone, the software version, the version of the Flex, and right now it's not, it's just sitting here so the program doesn't know what version of bootloader I have. Now I'm going to open up the flash file which is an SHX format that you might have seen on my desktop. And it is this one right here, it's R374G0E42.10R PDS5 LP0039 DRM Java blah blah blah. I'll explain what all that means in just a second. Okay. The first part of it, the R374G0E42.10R. That is what software version it's running. As you can see, I just actually flashed my phone with this exact file about 15 minutes ago and so it's running the same exact firmware the PDS is basically it's basically the bootloader it's not that important it really doesn't matter what PDS version you have the next one LP is a language pack basically there are different ones for different languages all of them include English so you can't go wrong it just depends which version it has some, phone, some language packs have UK English, some have US English. Uh, on Howard forums, there's a list of which ones. I believe LP2 and LP4 are US English, and all the others are UK English. But for the most part, that's not important. DRM means if there's any DRM on the phone. 0001 means there isn't. 2 or greater means there is. The only phone I've seen that has DRM are the iTunes phones. Next, this means that the phone supports Java. Okay. And whoops. Okay. The next part that's important, this just means it's for the V3. Most of this stuff is Im important. But this is. This is the flex version your phone is running. Now, when I downloaded this, I noted that it was stock Motorola unlocked. Now, you can get them singular branded, you can get them orange branded, which is a carrier in the UK. You can get them branded by quite a few companies. I get them unlocked because I'm sure they'll work, and I personally like the unlocked firmware the best. Different carriers use different icons and some different things. If you like a carrier, that's different than the one you have better, you can do that one as long as it's unlocked. Now, all you're going to do is, now that the phone, now that we know the phone is connected down here, and it says it's V3, all you're going to do, and since the file is open, all you're going to do is you're going to hit start, and it and it's going to switch the phone into flash mode, which if you look at the phone, it's going to look like it's restarting and there's going to be nothing on the screen. Now, this file is what's called a monster pack that I explained before that's both a flash and a flex in one file. I like these better because you don't have to guess which flashes will work with which flexes, vice versa, if you're getting, you know, if something might go wrong. These have already been tested and they know they work well together. Uh, and it's going to show, as you can see now, it says it's flashing code group 1 and it's 30 set, it's 40 percent done the entire process. Now it's going to go through 
code group 1, code group 2, code group 4. And that verifies checksums just to make sure that the flash is actually a Motorola flash. There's nothing wrong with it. Basic stuff like that. Usually there's no problem and then it automatically restarts your phone just because. Okay, now my phone has restarted itself. And as you can see, the flash has finished and my phone passed, which basically I didn't do anything wrong and it's a good file. So now I'm going to close RSD and I'm going to reopen P2K tools. Once again, switch it to P2K mode. Connect the phone. And then hit connect. As you can see, just like before, the phone is connected. There's a green light once again, meaning that the phone is connected. And it says it's a V3 again. Now I'm going to refresh the file list again and it shows me how much space I have and how many files are installed on my phone. These are all the built-in pics, built-in sounds, built-in video and other files. Okay. Now that my phone is connected and it's open in Explorer, you would go in, go back to let's say picture and you would just click upload and then re-upload a picture just like that very simple and as you can see it it hasn't shown up yet it w if you refresh this again it will show up and I'll just refresh it Okay, and now if I go back into picture, there's the picture I just added. Okay, let's continue on to the scene editor. The scene editor is to edit the way features of your phone work by basically editing the hex of the code of the flex. Now, all you would do is you would go to a scene map that I'm going to post in the show notes and you would find what scene you would need to do what you need. Let's say right now we're in scene number 32 underscore record number 1 or 32 and then there would be an underscore 0001. Now you would just find out which entry you need to change, like if you would need to change the decimal value to 1 to do what you need to do, and then you would just write it back to the phone. And you would do that for every seam you needed to change for something. Let's continue on. Now we're in, this is basically a way to change options you would change in the scene without after going through using a scene map and editing the you know editing that the code and all that stuff all you would do is go down to read options and then go through here for example in Java there's there are these options I like to turn on Java app loader DNS IP viewable and DNS IP changeable and now you're going to want to save your options and I believe you can save your options globally but I like to do it after every page and now you go into text messages and you can remove items from the menu of text messages if you'd like you can add or remove the option for delivery reports how your character count is if you're if the character count goes up or down, where it stores the text messages, and if you want the option to use a subject or not. 
Me, I'm going to leave everything the way it is here. Next is Other. Other has a lot of features that most of them don't work in recent, in newer phones. The only ones that I recommend turning on are Vibe Sync, Call Guard, and Message Alert. Uh, Vibe Sync is so that if your phone plays music, the vibration will actually be in sync to the music. Call Guard is so that you can block the phone from accident, ask, accidentally making a call when you're not on it. And Message Alert is so that basically if you're in a call, whether or not it will alert you when you get a text message. Next is P2K info. Basically, there's a place you can go on the phone where it will show you all the info of the flashes and flexes and stuff that you have on the phone. But if you don't feel like going into your phone, all you have to do is read, and that'll tell you your phone model. P2K Flex, and that'll tell you what Flex version you're running. Firmware, that'll tell you what firmware you're running. And some other info about uh, the release label for the Flash, what language pack you've got, what your DSP information is, and the platform you're on. Finally, here at least, we've got Java, which here are all the P all the programs I've got installed on the phone. You can remove whatever you'd like, you can add whatever you'd like, you know, as long as it's a Java game which most are compatible with Motorola phones. Personally, I see two Phonebook 3Ds on here, and this is the older one, so I'm just going to uninstall this. And as you can see, it's gone. Now, we'll go to Tools, and he from here, you can set alarms, you can do conversions, you can take your make what you've got on the phone a flex file. You can take a flex file that you have on your computer and decompile it to get pictures out of it or whatever you need and check to see if a flex file you're about to install on your phone is locked or not. Next is the external LCD where, like I said, right now I'm on my V3 Razor which has a color screen on the outside and it uses a picture file that is in a slash a slash mobile slash system and it's called cl.gif. If you want to change that to another picture, it must be 96 by 80 pixels and you must also rename it to cl.gif. Now that you have an interest in the phone company and phone freaking, you should understand something called scanning or um, prefix scanning and exchange scanning. Scanning is much like war dialing. Now war dialing is the act of having your computer or other device scan a range of phone numbers looking for other other computers. However, exchange and prefix scanning, you're not looking for just computers, you're looking for a whole bunch of stuff and you're also mapping how the phone system is put together. So you you know you can look for uh, private branch exchanges, test numbers, voicemail systems, uh, you know, a whole bunch of fun stuff out there. And for the same reason people war drive and war dial and even, even do radio scanning is you have no idea what's out there until you look. Now, you can, uh, you can hand scan, and that's just going to take you forever in a day. You can use a computer to do it, but there are some discrepancies with that because if you use a computer, there are some systems out there that are designed to detect whether or not a computer or a human is dialing a certain amount of numbers in a certain amount of time. Example, every single time, if you use a computer, every single time it, it dials, each tone is 90 milliseconds long and it uses the same, uh, the same uh, rate of dialing every single time and you're scanning like 10,000 numbers. Of course the phone, phone company's computer is going to go, okay, what's going on here? Now. Um, a lot of times people actually uh, still scan the 1-800 numbers because they're toll free and you can you can scan your your um, your local exchanges however you could be paying money for this because this is is on your phone bill and if you're um, 
if you're dialing out of your, your calling area, it could even be long distance. So if you decide to scan and use a computer and just let it sit overnight, you know, just, just to look for computers and you wind up getting a $3,000 phone bill because you didn't realize you were dialing long distance and you didn't have unlimited calls, we warned you. So um, the first thing I'd like to explain are low tones. Low tones and high tones are, are signals from the phone company a piece of equipment will make saying, I'm ready to be used, I'm ready for a command. Now, the number one thing that uses low tones are extenders. Extenders are put up by long distance co corporations or big business, so basically you call the extender, it'll give you a low tone or a greeting saying, please, please enter your password or so whatever, and you put in the PIN, you put in your password or whatever dialing format it, it requires, and it'll make like a third party call. So instead of you getting charged for it, the extender does. So it's kind of like having a calling card, but a, a big business will own it and they'll just pay a flat rate on that. Now keeping in mind that you can just systematically or even randomly try to break in by guessing the passcode, however that's considered cracking and that's a crime. You know, knowing that it's there is one thing, breaking in to use it, that's another. Now. Extenders normally don't identify themselves. They're very hard to hard, hard to fi uh, find out they're, that they're actually extenders. The easiest thing to realize, like that you found an extender, is the uh, is the AT and T Easy Reach, because as soon as you dial it, it says, "Welcome, welcome to AT and T Easy Reach. Please enter the uh, the number you're trying to dial." And the AT and T Easy Reach is basically someone decided they wanted to have uh, a toll free number linked to their home line. Businesses use it. People use it. Voicemail systems use it. There's Scan. See if see uh, see what you can find. Um, the next thing that you can look for is uh, our PBXs, our private branch exchanges. They're commonly used by hospitals, big businesses, stores. A lot of 800 numbers and 888, the toll-free services, have have PBXs on them because, you know, you, when you call up someplace and it goes, you know, welcome to so and so corporation. For English, press one. For Spanish, press two. For Stanglish, press three. That's a PBX. Now, a PBX it is a is a small little itty bitty exchange in itself. PBXs can be linked up with other PBXs. Now, a PBX or a company that owns a PBX, that PBX could actually um, own a block of phone numbers, say one eight hundred two five five zero zero one zero to zero zero two zero. So it'll have ten numbers that lead to the same PBX. However, that PBX could be controlling hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of of other phones that are in a building or linked to each other, like most tech supports for um, for computer companies, are controlled by a, a network of PBXs. Now, another thing about PBXs is a lot of stores, like big stores, like uh, here in the United States, Kmart, Walmart, Shoprite, Pathmark, you know, most most malls have it where you can actually call up the PBX and dial an extension of the PBX. Like, you dial into the PBX, the PBX says, you know, what extension are you looking for? You can dial an extension and hit the intercom for the store. I mean, there have been a couple of times where I was doing some local grocery shopping, the manager comes walking in, really pissed off, flips open his cell phone, pushes speed dial, and every, everything he said into the phone was going over the, over the loudspeaker. So you can have some pretty fun stuff with that, but keeping in mind that there's a difference between scanning legitimately and illegitimately. Illegitimately means you gotta break a passcode or you're doing something so you can gain access because it's password protected. So um there's a lot of a lot of common software that you can use on your uh, your DOS or Windows PC. I'm not too familiar with the Linux side, but if you're running Linux, I'm pretty sure you already know how to use a a war dialer. Um, the program I want to show you is called Phone Tag. Phone Tag is actually a war dialing dialing application that you can use once set up to uh, to do uh, a scan, and it's pretty nifty. So let's get on to that. Here we have Phone Tag. Phone Tag is a pretty hard program to find, and I'll try to put it up on the on the forums if you need it. The first thing you have to do in Phone Tag is hit your setup button and set up your modem. Make sure your COM port is actually selected to the, the proper port your modem's hooked up to. If you don't know how, go into Device Manager and check. Most modems, however, are always on port 3. The modem speed doesn't matter because we're not doing actual data communications because we're looking for audio, not data. Word format doesn't matter because, again, it, it implies that we're, we're scanning for data. 
The dial speed in milliseconds. I like 90 because I like to hear the tones going by, uh, the, the DTMF tones, that is. And make sure your modem speaker is always on because if you can't hear what's, what's going on, then there's no point in doing this. The dial patience is how long the program is going to wait before hanging up and trying the next number. You can do some randomness between it, but I personally don't care. A lot of people uh, would agree with, with the fact that there are, is software that the phone company runs on their systems to detect scanning, but I have never heard of anyone going to jail for, um, for doing any kind of scanning. I do know people that have gone to jail because they've used, uh, they found some stuff in a scan, broke into it, and then did some naughty, naughty things. The dialing prefix and suffix I won't get into. That's a little bit more advanced, as well as the modem initialization string. Just leave it alone. Stealth mode off, because if you put stealth mode on, it's going to actually minimize to the tray, and you're not going to know where it is. You're not going to hear it. It's going to be absolutely silent. You save your settings. Back to the main screen. Go to File. New Dial List. Now, you can either select which numbers you want to go through, but, to be honest, we're just going to do something simple. Now I'm going to use the number pad to punch in a string. 1-800-255-XXXX. And we'll have it shuffle. And basically, what I just told it to do is generate a list that had every single number in 1-800-255 and shuffle it. And there's our list. And all we have to do now is hit our Go button. And it's going to go through every single one of the numbers and it's going to look for the modem, but because we can listen in, we can hear if we find anything interesting. Now, you can do this by hand, it takes a very long time. There are other programs, such as um, THC Tools, or is it THC Scan? Well, both great applications do the same job. There's A-Dial, W-Dial, although a lot of them run in a DOS environment. Um, if you're really interested, look at the forums in the show notes, and I'll put a link to a really good one that'll actually run on pretty much any Windows system. Uh, if you're running Linux, I apologize, because yeah, I, I'm assuming if you know how to run Linux, you already know how to do uh, a war dial and an, ex an, and an exchange scan. Now, now that you have an understanding of the basics, if you're really interested, go out there, scan an exchange, Hop on the forums or hop on IRC, and we can all get together as a group, and we can we can tackle an exchange all together, so it doesn't take you three years to do it. Have fun.